Ahoy everyone, I hope this video finds you well. This is the start of the series Clongify, where I look at languages that have been mentioned in passing in works of fiction and flesh them out into fully functional languages. This episode, we'll be looking at the language Vostiak. So, I read this book called The Last of the Vostiaks by Diego Morani. It's about a man who is the last of his tribe, the eponymous Vossiaks, who as a child becomes mute after suffering in the Gulags, forced labour camps in the Soviet Union. Eventually he is released from the Gulag and begins to remember his mother tongue of Vostiak. The book concerns ideas of linguistic purity, nationalism, linguistic identity, and other highfalutin concepts, and alongside these ideas are snippets of the Vostiak language uttered by the protagonist. This video aims to take those snippets and stitch them together into a full quilt of language. I had two main tasks to start with. One, gather up all the Vostiak words mentioned in the text, and two, gather all the ancillary information about the language mentioned, which thankfully is quite specific because a lot of the characters are linguisticians. So here are all the Vostiak words in the text, as written, with a note on what they mean or might mean or the context they were found in. I'll take a moment here for you to have a look and for me to grab a warm drink. There's also a transcription of the song at the end, but it's pretty clearly just faux finish, so I'm not going to include it. And here is everything that's said about the language, which for comedy's sake I shall read aloud. Even the fricative lateral with the labiovelar appendix. They're all there. The consonants which mark the transition between the Finnic languages and the Eskimo alien ones. His velar and guttural consonants, for example, speak volumes. They are all posterior sounds made with the back of the mouth. I tried addressing him in Vogel. I noticed that those sounds were familiar to him. It might be some localized variant of Jurak, but I was unconvinced by the coup de glotte. At first it was the Shah which unsettled me. I'd never heard it so unvoiced before. But when I noticed how the man produced his velar affricatives, and above all his retroflex palatals, I was no longer in any doubt. Uttering those primitive sounds, I too felt that I was back in the past. Helsinki, he said again, flatly, though in fact it turned out to be meant as a question. He had been surprised by the Vostiak's tone of voice. When asking a question, after initially rising, it then seemed to fall. Then he remembered the interrogative prefix. Unlike in Finnic languages of the Baltic group, in Proto-Uralic the interrogative particle was thought not to exist. He wanted to hear the famous velar affricatives and retroflex palatals with his own ears. Aurtova waved goodbye to the Vostiak and went out into the street, then set off hastily towards the car relieved to be free of his charge, but a little disappointed still not to have heard the lateral affricative with labiovelar overlay. Yeah, it's a weird book, but I loved it. And yeah, not all of this makes sense, but it's something to start with. Now, looking just at the Vostiak words, we can see that the orthography lends itself to multiple interpretations. Starting with the word Vostiak, what is the value of the CH digraph at the end? I think it's K because the Italian name of the book is L'Ultimo dei Vostiaki. But what about the CH in Ticholvon? My anglophone instinct says that it's CH, but given the propensity of Siberian languages to de-affricate alveodental affricates to palatalized stops, I'm going to say it's the same as the TY digraph and put in the voiceless palatalized alveolar stop, T, into the inventory. I think the umlauts represent fronting, and that the letter Y is either the palatal approximant Y or a palatalization of the previous consonant, and that the NG digraph is the velar nasal E. I'm still not sure what the KH and X represent in these two words, but nevertheless, going through the list of words one by one, we get this. Which I think is a good starting point for our Vostiak phonology. I've left the velar nasal and the palatalized voiceless velar stop in brackets because I'm not convinced they are phonemes in their own right yet. The velar nasal could just be an allophone assimilating to the place of articulation of the following k, 
and the palatalized voiceless velar stop could be a cluster. Turning to the ancillary information about the language, we see there is a lateral fricative with labiovelar appendix. This means it's either schwa or zhua, which we can decide the voicing of later. A labiovelar lateral affricate is also mentioned, which I think we can safely say is the voiceless kwa. A coup de glot is mentioned, which is a glottal stop. This might be a phoneme in its own right, or it might only manifest as part of a glottalized tone, such as found in the Ket language. I'll put it in brackets. We can add that unsettling schwa into the vowels, and velar affricate suggests at least kh with some possible friends. Retroflex palatals, so far as I can tell, is complete gibberish, and I'm not willing to buy an Italian copy of the book and find someone familiar with linguistics terminology in Italian to find out what it was translated from, so I'm just going to ignore this one. Let me know if you have any better ideas. Primitive sounds also has no meaning, so we'll ignore that too. So this is what it looks like we're working with. I think it is worth filling out the voiced coronal stop series with dia. But is there anything we might be overlooking? We are told the sounds of Vogul are familiar to the Vostiak. Vogul, also known as Mansi, has this inventory. But I don't think something sounding familiar necessarily means that sounds are shared. And even if there are shared sounds, which ones are they? Nevertheless, looking at the Mansi inventory reminds me that in our prospective Vostiak, we have the vila affricative k with no vila fricative k, so I'll add that in. Nevertheless, if Mansi sounds familiar to the Vostiak man, then perhaps he lived in an area with widespread Mansi Vostiak bilingualism, as there's an awful lot of bilingualism in the Siberian area, even when one does not take Russian into account due to the traditionally widespread practice of exogamy. I'd have to read more about this though, so don't take my word as gospel. Coming back to that vila nasal, Gregory Anderson in Towards a Typology of the Siberian Linguistic Area suggests that a four-way nasal contrast is present in most Siberian languages, either old or innovated, consisting of ma, na, nya, ma. So I'll allow our eng to be a full phoneme and not merely an allophone. Also, I just really like the ang as a sound, and ultimately, this is my comment, so I probably would have included it anyway. Looking back, I think that the H might represent kh because of its presence in kanto and heinu, so for the moment, we'll demote H to merely being a possible phony. Other things we can infer from the words is that 1. Geminates are allowed, 2. The maximal syllable structure appears to be CVC, and three, vowels appear to be allowed in hiatus, like in suolta or an ululutoion, unless we add a labiovelarized sua as a phoneme to make suolta, and interpret ululutoion as ululutoion. Lastly, I speculate these other things might be true, that there is contrastive vowel length, and that there is word initial stress. Now, one of the main themes in the book is the idea that the Finnic languages are related to the languages of North America, albeit limited to the eskimo Elliot ones. Indeed, there's that segment, consonants which mark the transition between Finnic languages and eskimo Elliot ones. Interpreting this liberally, I would say the author is saying that Vostiak is the descendant of a common mother language of Finnish, via Proto-Uralic, and proto eskimo Eliot. Here's a diagram. This theory is the Uralo-Siberian language theory, proposed in 1998 by the linguist Michael Fortescue in the book Language Relations Across Bering Strait. Here's a picture of the copy I've been working from in the library of the Scott Polar Research Institute. Fortescue proposes that the inventory of Proto-Uralo-Siberian is something like this, with some changes by me. So it might be helpful to try and see what sound changes might have led to the modern and fictional Vostiak branch to see if our inventory is missing anything. But just before we do that, we know that there is more than one velar affricate, so I'll add in kh, and likewise in the fricatives kh. Also, having a labialized sound usually presupposes a non-labialized counterpart, so we can add in a plain lateral affricate and fricative, 
and and I'll just say that they're all voiceless. Lastly, given the ostensible reconstructed language history of Uralo-Siberian, and therefore Vostiak, I think having the glottal stop as a tone phoneme like in Ket is unlikely, given that Ket does not form part of the proposed Uralo-Siberian family. But I like glottal stops, so I'll make it fully phonemic anyway, while nixing the glottal fricative. Now, sound changes. Looking at these side by side, it seems to me that the voiced stops in Vostiak correspond neatly to the voiced fricatives in Proto-Uralo-Siberian, so we can imagine a sound change where they all just fortify, perhaps via an initial stage of fortification in stressed syllables, and then analogize from there. But this begs the question, where does the Vostiak V come from? Well, instead of creating an origin point for it, I thought it just might be a dissimulated allophone of W in front of rounded vowels, so we can remove it from the inventory. Now, how are we going to evolve those lateral fricatives and affricates? One easy way is to have clusters where L, L, follow S, T, S, T, T, and K. However, to make them phonemes and not merely allophones, we need to disrupt or get rid of the environment that forms them originally. Given that our syllable structure in Proto-Uralo-Siberian is strict CVC, we could only get medial clusters, and with initial stress everywhere, things are kind of locked into place. However, we can introduce a stress shift. Let's say that CV syllables are light and CVC syllables are heavy. Then we might say, stress shifts to the second syllable of a word if that second syllable is heavy and the first syllable is light, or this in notation form. From there, we can say that the unstressed initial vowel in certain circumstances reduces to nothing, creating initial clusters, which are then reanalyzed as single consonants. Now, labialization. We could say that the two laterals in Proto-Uralo-Siberian drift in their articulation to being velarized and plain, instead of plain and palatalized, and that the velarized version, also known as dark L, gains a labialized quality due to W and L sounding so similar. This labialized flavor is carried over into the clusters, giving us the labialized lateral fricative and affricate, while the original palatalized L just then becomes a plain L, which forms the unlabialized counterparts L and T. However, we need to make some labialization without the use of dark L for our velar fricative and affricate. Qualities on a vowel can often jump onto a consonant, or vice versa, just like how often tone comes about. So let's say that the rounded vowels O, U, lose their rounding and become E, U leaving labialization behind on the consonants that precede them. I've chosen for the vowels to transform into other vowels already extant in the system, as opposed to being strictly back, because for me, in this language, I'm treating er and u as back vowels. However, this labialization via unrounding will not apply to labial consonants, because I think pwa, bwa, and mua are ugly, and already have the feature plus labial and it won't apply to highly sonorous sounds, simply because I do not want it to. Also, I want this feature only to apply to velas. Given this, we should probably add qu and gu to our inventory. Thanks to our stress changes from earlier, we'll also get some onset clusters being reanalyzed as singletons, so let's have q and g as well, and a few labialized sounds will arise from clusters with w. I imagine that quite a range of onset clusters will be allowed, provided that the first element is very low on the sonority scale and the second element very high, and whereby only clusters with the original laterals and approximants are reanalyzed as single segments. Another sound change I think would be cool is if clusters that are reanalyzed as single segments leave behind compensatory length if they occur at the junction of a stressed and unstressed syllable. For instance, a word like sulanta would stress change to sulanta which would become something like slanta and collapse to slanta. Then, when all SL sequences are reanalyzed as a single you might get a word that was formerly naslak, becoming naslak. But to justify why the first syllable remains stressed despite being short and followed by a heavy syllable, it is reanalyzed as being long. Naslak. Right, now we just need an origin for H. I've got a little inspiration from Spanish here, where formerly sh became a so I thought I'd just take sh and have that become a sh 
which in turn becomes ch near back vowels, including u uh and u, uh, and velas, while sh around front vowels dissimulates back to plain s. Uh. To get the glottal stop, I think that heterogeneous stop-stop clusters will have the first stop debucalize, and then the whole cluster debucalizes. Now, these sound changes are currently unordered, so to test them, let's whip up a generator for random words in Lexifer using the phonological inventory of Proto-Uralo-Siberian, and then test the sound changes to modern Vostiak in Lexigy to see whether any other sounds pop out or whether there are any undesirables I ought to take care of. But I'll do that for the next video, so sit tight. And in the meantime, as always, don't like and don't subscribe.